Okay, so I think we're ready to go. So here, you know, if you've never done a Zoom session before, it's actually a pretty easy technology. You might as well see it. In fact, you know, you know the valuation of the week is Zoom, so you might have had a chance to try it out. But um, it's um, it's a simple technology, though I'm probably stretching it with as many people as we have in this group. Uh, usually, the way it works is if you um, if you have a question, you can put up your hand. But there are too many people for me to do that. So here's what I would do. I'll pause at times and ask for questions and you can type in your question in the chat box. I can see whatever question you have. So as we go through, if you have questions, just you know, type it into the chat box and it should show up, you know, into the, um, you know, and, and we can we can basically then move from there. So I know it's not as good as being in a classroom, but this it is what it is. So we, we have to do it for this session and perhaps the two sessions when we get back. Couple of things, as we do this, I'm going to prod you to get started on your project. Continue, if you're doing evaluation, continue the evaluation. This is a good time to get caught up because odds are that if you have travel plans have been canceled, you're stuck at home, might as well get this done. So let's see where we are. We've pretty much done the mechanics of DCF, right? We started by talking about how to estimate cash flows and discount rates and growth rates and we closed all with terminal value. Then we did all those loose ends, how to deal with cash and cross holdings. And so the mechanics are done. This is the hard work, it's behind you. Now comes the fun part. Now you have to think about actually valuing companies. And today I want to talk about how to value a company, you need to tell a story. I describe valuation as a bridge between stories and numbers. What I mean by that is when you show me your revenues in year 10 and I ask you why your revenues, what they are, I need to hear a story about your company that explains those revenues. So essentially, when you talk about, and this is actually goes back to what we talked about in the very first class where I asked you, are you, you know, what comes more naturally to you? And I said, valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. And that sounded kind of abstract. So one of the things I'm going to do today is actually take you through the process of telling a story about a company and converting the story to numbers. I'm going to use Uber in June of 2014 as my illustrative example. But we can, you can bring up other companies. You can talk about Casper and Zoom and whatever the comp or maybe your company is. And let's test out how we go from stories to numbers. And the reason we do that is that's the only way our numbers are going to stay consistent. A story actually is going to make sense. It's the only way you're going to have faith in your own valuation. So let's start with, there's a five-step process. I'm going to start with the first step in the process. When you sit down to value a company, what's the first thing you need to do? You need to understand what the company does, what its products are, why people like its products or don't like its products, who its management is. So you first need to understand the company. Then you need to understand the market or markets after, uh, that you see it growing in. Now, what are those markets? How are they growing? Who are the compar uh, competitors in those markets? What are their strengths relative to you as a company? And finally, you've got to bring in the macro environment in which the story operates. Now, I, this is, a, this is a, a side story, but yesterday when I valued Zoom, all of these things came in, right? It is a, it's a company, we know what its product is, it's allowed, we're using it right now. Its management is, 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 seems, pretty, is, seems pretty good at doing what they're doing. The market that they're in is this online meeting market. And it's uh, about six billion in 2019. It's a pretty small market still, but it's growing. It's growing even before the coronavirus. And I'll talk about how that virus might change the entire landscape of the market. And the competition it faces is both old and new. The old competitor was WebEx, which is a Cisco product. You have a lot of new you know, com companies all trying to do what Zoom does. And the macro environment is clearly going to make a difference because this environment, people obviously are not traveling as much. They can't have face-to-face -face meetings. Many of them are using Zoom. And that's not surprising. The question is how many of them after using Zoom will decide that this isn't a bad way to do meetings, that maybe this should be the way they do it, which means the potential market for online meetings could be much larger as a result of this crisis than without it. So let's get the show on the road. Let me go back to June of 2014, which is the first time I valued Uber. And at that time, I really didn't know much about Uber. So I read a news story in the Wall Street Journal that said Uber, a company called Uber had been priced at 17 billion by venture capitalists. Notice the word I used, priced. The venture capitalists had invested 3 billion to $17 billion pricing. Venture capitalists don't value companies, they price them. And I was surprised. I had no idea what Uber did, so I decided I needed to investigate. 
So I started talking to people not my age, about you know, my, my nephew, my son, about what Uber did. And very quickly, I started collecting information on the Uber process. Basically, my idea of car service was a taxi cab, which I never took anywhere. I took the subway. It was a taxi cab. And Uber clearly was changing that business in many ways. First, it allowed you to connect with a car with, uh, and in fact, the way I found out more about Uber is the first time I used it. I remember I was in my office in 2014. I downloaded the app and then I hit the app and magical things started to happen on my smartphone. A GPS opened up and I saw a car trying to drive towards me. Why trying? Because in New York City, you don't get from point A to point B, you try. And this car was trying. So 15 minutes later, the car pulled up in front of me and I, you know, as I was watching the car, I could see a name in the car, George, and I, this never happened to me with the yellow cap. 15 minutes later, George and his car pull up in front of Stern and I run out and, you know, run out of the car and say, hi, George. And he says, where do you want to go? You didn't enter a destination. And I said, nowhere in particular. Can you drive me around for 30 minutes? I have some questions to ask you. He thought for a moment I was a serial killer, but then he decided that, you know, he, you know that, I look, I look too small to be a threat. He said, get in the back seat. Absolutely. So then I started asking him questions. I said, is this an Uber car you're driving? He said, no, this is uh, my car. And I said, are you an Uber employee? He said, I'm an independent contractor. And I said, why do you do this? He said, I have a regular job in which I don't make enough money. This allows me to take a car I already own and essentially make a second income. And I said, why do you need Uber? He said, in New York City, it's illegal to stop on the street and offer people a ride. Uber connects me with customers. 30 minutes later, he drops me on back off at Stern. I offered to pay him. He should have just taken the money. He said, you don't have to pay me. I said, it's free. He said, no, it's not free. When you, when you downloaded the app, they asked you for a credit card. I said, yes. I said, well, they'll charge you. And I said, how do you get paid? And he said, they'll send me 80% of the fare. And I remember asking why 80%. He said, I don't know. That's what they all do. And he drives off. At this stage, I could see why this driver drove for Uber. He took a car he already owned, and which he was already paying insurance and cut, and this allowed him to earn a second income. I said, okay. Then I thought about why people like my son and my niece might like Uber. So I called my son and I said, no, what do you like about Uber? And he said, I can call the car from the bar. I said, that's a plus. You can call the car from your phone. Much more. 21st century than running out to the street, putting your life at risk and waving your hands around and hoping that a car stops. And I said, I know, and what else do you like about it? He said, you know, I don't have to carry cash with me. It allows me to basically get from point A to point B without having to deal with the cab. I said, but these cars must cost a lot, right? He said, no, they're cheaper than a cab. I said, really? But you must wait forever, right? He said, no, it comes sooner than a cab. I said, cars must be filthy, right? He said, no, they're cleaner than a cab. I said, let me get this straight. They come sooner than a cab, they're cheaper than a cab, they're cleaner than a cab. I knew at that time that car service, that Uber was going to destroy the traditional taxi cab business. So the question then was, what was, you know, what was Uber getting out of this? Obviously, they were getting 20% of fares for pretty much being a broker, connecting drivers to customers. And I said, what's so special about Uber? Why couldn't I do this in my basement, get a big computer and connect drivers to customers? And I could think of two things that Uber had that I did not. The first was $3 billion. They raised that from VCs. I didn't, and that's a bit of a disadvantage. The second is they have a networking benefit. What does that mean? The first mover in a business like this, as you get bigger, it actually gets easier to get bigger. And think of why. If you're a driver thinking about driving for a car service, you can drive with a startup car service, which has hardly any cars on the road, or, or Uber, which has 50% of the, you're going to go with the largest car service because that's where the customers are. And if you're a customer, if you want an app on your phone, you want the app or the largest car service. That's what networking benefits basically mean. As you get larger, it gets easier to get larger. So my research on Uber basically came from talking to people. And I want to emphasize this because for many of you, research will mean downloading data from S&P Capital IQ, doing ratios. That's all useful. But for a company like Uber, it wouldn't have helped. Why? Because there were no financials to download, no history to look at. The younger your company, the more you have to find out what they do and the more you have to talk to people to understand what they do or read up what they do. And that becomes the basis for your story. So in fact, with Uber, when I was done with my research, if you can call it this, I drew a picture of everything I'd learned. I drew a picture of why drivers liked Uber, why customers liked Uber. 
how the pricing mechanism worked, how they split the proceeds, what costs Uber fa faced, and they have very little cost, and what kind of reinvestment they needed to grow. And given that they don't own the cars and don't hire the drivers, growing in a new city was almost effortless at Uber. That was my, the basis for my Uber story. So the first step is the surveying the landscape. So at this stage, I want to pause and ask you to think about <coughs> your company. Before you tell a story about a company, try to understand what it does, what it produces, and if it has strengths, what those strengths are, weaknesses. This is your chance to get that big picture perspective of a company because without a solid foundation, all kinds of terrible things are going to happen. You try to tell a story. So now I have a basis. Let me tell a story. And when you think about the story you're going to tell, remember, this is a valuation story, not a creative novel. Don't make characters wander on and wander off for no reason at all. Don't create, you know, three-headed dogs if you don't have to. You know, so basically this, when you tell a business story, you want to keep it simple, you want to keep it focused, and you want to connect it to reality. Three very simple rules. Let's start with the first one. Keep it simple. I'll tell you the kind of story you don't want to tell if you're a business. I remember about 12 years ago, my oldest son came to me with a reading suggestion. He said, Dad, you got to read this amazing book. And he gave me this book and it was so thick, I almost fell over, it was so heavy. And I looked at the front of the book and it said, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin. And you know what? I tried. I really, really, really tried to read the book. And after about two weeks, I called my oldest son and I said, Ryan, I'm too old for this. I mean, there are hundreds of characters in this book. They wander on, they wander off, they die, they come back to life. They're good guys, they're bad guys. I kind of give up. And if, you know, so if you're telling a business story, don't make it Game of Thrones. You don't have eight seasons and 80 episodes to tell your story. You have like 15 minutes. Keep it simple. Keep it focused. What's the end game for every business? Ultimately, no matter what business you're in, you have to show me a pathway to making money. You don't have to show me you make money next year. I'm a realist. You're a young company. It might take you a while, but at least tell me you've thought about the possibility that one day you'll have to make money. You'll be amazed at how many founders at startups fail this very simple test. Because you ask them, they, they're so caught up in how neat their app is and how many downloads it has. And you ask them, how do you plan to make money? And they just skip right over the question. Let me tell you how neat the app is. At least think about are you, how do you plan to make money? What's your basic business model? And third, make sure your story is grounded in reality. So if you're making up stuff as you go along in the story, it's not going to hold up in practice. So that's the second step. So let me give you my Uber story in June of 2014. You're saying, why do I keep emphasizing June of 2014? Because I've valued Uber every year for the last six years on my blog. And do you think my story for Uber has changed? Of course it has. Why? Because the facts have changed. I've learned about Uber. And as the facts have changed, my story has changed. It's changed in good ways sometimes, bad ways others. But in June of 2014, this was my initial story for Uber. I saw them as an urban car service company. Two key words there, urban and car service. I saw them succeeding in cities and big towns as a car service business which will expand the business by bringing in new users. People like my son and my niece who otherwise wouldn't have used cabs are more likely to come into this business with local networking benefits. I already explained what networking benefits were, that if Uber became the largest ride-sharing company in New York, it would become dominant because everybody would, fl would flock to it. You saying, what's the local doing in here? Let's say Uber does become the largest ride-sharing company in New York and dominates the city but I fly to Chicago. Once I land in Chicago, I no longer care who the largest ride-sharing company in New York is. I care about the largest ride-sharing company in Chicago. And in my world, here's what can happen. Uber can take New York, Lyft can take Chicago, Didi can take Beijing, and Ola can take Mumbai, and a Grab can take Kuala Lumpur. You're saying, who cares? The kind of market share I can give Uber is going to be driven by this part of the story. I am going to assume, and this was what I assumed in June, June of 2014, that they can maintain that 20% share. Completely arbitrary if you think about it. So Travis just made it up after a dinner or something. And the fact that they don't own the cars and don't hire the drivers, which gives them a very low capital intensive model. Latch on to the story because every number in my valuation has its roots in the story. Now, before I actually step into the valuation phase, I've got to stop and make sure the story I've told you passes what I call a 3P test. 
Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Let me explain. Lots of things are possible. All you have to show me that something is possible, it can happen, right? Very low threshold. Plausible basically means you've got to show me that somebody out there has done something like this before, that you can actually show me that, no, that there is evidence that it can happen, that it's happened and somebody's pulled it off. So it's a little tougher than possible. And finally, probable basically means you've got to show more proof that you've actually tried something like this on a small scale and it's worked. Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? And in fact, I'll give you a couple of ways in which you can think through possible, plausible, pro probable. And it's very relatable, I think, especially if you're a sports fan. About two years ago, I was in Latin America doing a three-city tour. It was October of 2017. And I was in Sao Paulo on day one. I was in Santiago, Chile on day two, and Lima, Peru on day three. And I was trying to think, I was doing the session on stories and numbers and possible, plausible, probable was going to come up. So I was thinking, about, can I think about a good example in a Brazil, for a Brazilian audience where I can ask them a question and everybody in the room will have an opinion. So it can't be something about markets or about a company because people are not going to hold back. So I said, what is the one thing that every Brazilian has an opinion on? Any, any ideas? What do you think the one topic? that every Brazilian will have an idea on, will have an opinion on. Soccer, exactly. Perfect. So here's what I asked them. I asked them, is it possible? Do you remember, this is six months before the last World Cup. I asked them, is it possible that Brazil will win the World Cup? You asked 300 Brazilians, is it possible Brazil will win the World Cup? What do you think the answer is? Of course. Then I said, is it plausible that Brazil will win the World Cup? <clears throat> And they thought for a moment, and you know what, if I'd asked this question in December of 2014, the room would have been shaky. You say, what happened in 2014? Only a non-soccer fan would ask what happened in 2014. 2014 was the Rio World Cup. And if you remember, in one of the great shellackings of all time, Brazil lost to Germany by a score that they'd never forgotten. But by 2017, they were feeling pretty good about themselves. So they said, yeah, it's plausible. Now we're second ranked in the world again. We can pull this off. Then I asked, is it probable? And now you could see the wheels go into motion. If Neymar stays healthy and he doesn't flip and flop and do whatever Neymar does when he's on the ground, and if this happens and this happens, it's probable. Is it possible, plausible, probable? And I said, this worked really well. I'll try it in Chile tomorrow. I should have done my homework, but I did not. I show up in Santiago, I ask exactly the same question. Is it possible that Chile will win the World Cup? 100 Chileans in the room, half of them start crying uncontrollably. I said, what the heck did I do? It turned out that the week before, Chile had lost 2-1 to Argentina in one of the qualifying rounds and had been knocked out of World Cup contention. Now, I think one of the requirements for winning the World Cup is you actually have to be there. So I didn't have the heart after that to ask, is it plausible, is it probable? If it's impossible, what's the point? Now, as a, as a, as a sports fan, I asked this question about the Yankees, right? Four weeks ago, if you ask, is it possible that the Yankees will win the World Series? I said, of course it's possible. We won it 27 times before. Is it plausible? Yeah, it looks really good. We've signed Jared Cole. Our team looks really good. And so it's probable. Well, I think if I'd added an if, I said, if everybody stays healthy, it's probable. I still think it's definitely possible. In fact, right now, it's possible that any team could win the World Series. I think it's still plausible, but it's become less probable. Why? Because Aaron Judge has just gone down with, we don't know what, a broken rib. Is that going to be two weeks? You know, is, uh, so in a sense, things so you can see how possible, plausible, and probable can shift as the facts come in at you. So my suggestion is pick your favorite sports team and ask the question, is it possible, is it plausible, is it probable? Is it the Baltimore Orioles? I feel sorry for you. If it's a Mets, well, it's always possible. It's always plausible, but it never seems to be probable. I hate to take that side swipe, but it is what it is. It is a good way to think about the difference between possible, plausible, and probable. Now, let me give you examples of impossible stories, implausible stories, and improbable stories. One of the challenges, when you know, one of the things you will notice in M and A valuations is what's called a fairness opinion. Do you know what a fairness opinion is? Is when you do an acquisition of a company, yeah, you get a fairness opinion from an independent third party. I'm going to put quotes around the word independent. Usually, it's an investment banker who comes in 
and basically says the deal was fair. What does that get you? If you're an acquirer, it gives you a shield against getting sued. So 1986, the Delaware courts created this rule that if you get a fairness opinion from an independent appraiser, you cannot be sued. So after every acquisition, the companies go out and hire a banker to justify the deal. To show you how meaningless a fairness opinion is, there's never been a deal in history that's been stopped because you could not get a fairness opinion. Because you can't get it from one guy, you get it from another guy, you keep shopping till you get it. So I know that bankers break pretty much every rule when it comes to fairness opinions, that they do things that they should not be doing. So I expect them to break the rules and usually I cut them a lot of slack. So this was about four years ago when Tesla bought Solar City, one of the most hopelessly conflicted deals of all time. And think of why. Who's the largest shareholder in Tesla? A guy called Elon Musk. Who's the largest shareholder in Solar City? A guy called Elon Musk. Who's the CEO of Tesla? A guy called Elon Musk. Who's the CEO of Solar City? A guy called Musk with a different first name, Elon's cousin. So when Tesla bought Solar City, they knew they were going to get sued and they decided to hire some protection or get some protection. So they went out and hired Evercore to evaluate the deal. Now Evercore is, a, is an investment bank in New York, very highly regarded. So they come in and their job was to actually value Tesla and value Solar City to show that the exchange ratio was right. So a few weeks later, they filed their fairness opinion. It's public. It's, it's a public document. So I go and look at their fairness opinion to see how they justified the deal. And I look to see how they value Tesla, a company that I'm obsessed with. So I was fascinated with it. So I, you know, I look at the valuation and they have you know, five years of cash flows. And I look to see where they've got the cash flows. And they're very direct. They said, we got the cash flows from the board of directors of Tesla. How this is an opinion of fair, I don't know but they just got the cash. You said, where did the Tesla board of directors get the cash flows? They got them from Goldman Sachs equity research. What a tangled web we weave when we try to deceive. I mean, Goldman Sachs was Tesla's native investment bank. They got their equity research department to feed cash flows to the board. The board fed them to Evercore and Evercore plugged them in. Again, where there's an opinion from Evercore, I don't know. Then they applied a discount rate, but then they got to the end of year five and they had to decide what to do. They have no more cash flows. So guess what they did? They estimated a growth rate forever. Not a bad thing, right? We've talked about how that's okay. They assume, assumed a growth rate of 6% a year forever. My first reaction was, what currency are you doing the valuation in Argentine pesos? And you forgot to tell me it was in US dollars. What do you think would happen to Tesla if it grew at 6% a year in US dollar terms forever? In about 30 years, it'll be the US economy. In about 50 years, it'll be the global economy. I can't even visualize an, an economy that's all Tesla all the time. You'd have to live in your Tesla, eat your Tesla, get healthcare from your Tesla. Basically, everything would have been delivered in your Tesla. It is. And then what happens after 50 years, even if you buy into this outlandish notion? You'd have to bring in outer space. The only way I can bring this in is to bring in SpaceX and put Teslas on spaceships and send them to Mars. You'd have to find Martians to buy Teslas. This is just an impossible story. It is one of the worst DC valuations I've ever seen. And for this piece of crap, you know how much Evercore got paid? Nine and a half million dollars. There's no justice in this world. Impossible valuation. Let's take a second example. You have to pick a company to value, right? Remember, I'm nagging you now. And one of the companies that gets picked repeatedly in this class is Netflix. I'm sure some of you are valuing Netflix. Why? It's exciting. It's fun. But it's a really difficult company to get a value much higher than the price because it's so richly priced. So this is about two years ago, three years ago. Somebody's valuing Netflix in the class. And midway through the semester, remember that feedback chance I give you where you send in your DCF and, and I'm reminding you again, you have a chance in about three weeks to send in your DCF for feedback. So this was in the middle of that semester. He sends in his DCF of Netflix and he comes up with a value three times higher than the price. And I'm shocked. How do you get a value so high? So I look at his revenues and the revenues in year 10 are $600 billion. $600 billion. So I email the person doing the valuation. He said, can you come in and talk to me? So he comes in and I said, do you have Netflix? And he said, yes. And I said, how much do you pay per year? So he pulled out his calculator, seemed to be attached to his head. Click, click, click. And he said, about $100 a year. I said, that's interesting. You have $600 billion in revenues in year 10. How much would you need? How many subscribers would you need 
to get to 600 billion. He pulled out his calculator again and I said, you don't need a damn calculator. 600 billion divided by 100 is 6 billion subscribers. He said, I don't see where this questioning is going. I said, just hang in there. I have a couple more questions. I said, what's the population of the world? He said, I don't know. I have to go check Wikipedia. I said, I'll save you the trouble. It's about 7 billion. I said, is there something you're not telling me? Maybe there's a law that's been passed. It says every man, woman, child and household pet has to have their own Netflix account and no sharing. He said, don't be absurd. I said, I'm not the one with six, 600 billion revenues. You are. And you know what his answer was? I just used last year's numbers. I said, what? He said, I took the growth rate last year and I put it as the growth rate every year for the next 10 years. Amazing what compounding does when it meets with Excel. When you do your valuation, look at your revenues in your 10. Do not just look at the growth rate. It will give you a very misleading picture of what you're actually assuming. So first stop on your valuation is check and make sure you haven't told an impossible story. So when you value, you know, whether, whether you're valuing Beyond Meat or whether you're valuing Zoom, you look at the revenue in your 10. And I've given Zoom revenues of 12 billion, which is actually higher than the 6 billion in total market right now. The only way I can justify it is the actual market was expected to grow to 20, 20 billion in 2024 and 30 or 35 billion in 2029. I think the potential market is going to be even bigger than that. So my justification for a $12 billion revenue is the market is going to get much, much bigger and Zoom is going to be one of the big players. You're saying, how do you know? I don't. It's my story. You might disagree with me, but at least you can see where my numbers are coming from. So the first stop is to make sure you're not telling me impossible stories. For instance, if you tell me a story of how your company is going to continue to grow by cutting costs, not just this year, not just next year, but forever, I'm going to stop you because you can cut costs to zero and then you can't cut costs anymore. If you keep depreciating things without CapEx, I'm going to say stop. You can't depreciate what you, know, what you can't CapEx. So impossible stories are fairy tales. There's nothing to really discuss until you fix the impossibility. Implausible stories can happen. So these are stories where you grow without reinvesting very much, or you have profits but no competitors enter in, or you make high returns without risk, but they're implausible because usually they don't happen in a comparative product market. So I'm gonna push you on them and say, tell me why. I'll give you, um, um, an, an example of um, uh, of a company where you know you might have something like this. You have you know two years ago somebody in my class um, valued a company called Almarai. Almarai is a Saudi milk pro uh, not producing company which had and when they valued the margins they gave the company were fifteen percent, almost twice the size of margins of food processing companies in the Middle East. So I call the person and say, well, how come the margins are so high? Why isn't there more competition in Saudi Arabia? And he pulled out uh, the, uh, the top 17 stockholders in Almarai and he showed me the list. And top of the list was somebody, somebody, Bin Saud, part of the House of Saud, royal family. There was a competitive advantage, keeping the competition up. That answered my question. I said, okay. Or another example was a company which was um, a, a toll road company in Asia. And it had high growth. He projected high growth. In fact, this goes to the improbable part. There are three parts to every valuation. There's a growth assumption, there's a reinvestment assumption, there's a risk assumption. And usually when you have high growth, you have high reinvestment and high risk. When you have low growth, you have low reinvestment and low risk. And this guy had high growth for his toll road company, low reinvestment and low risk. And I said, that's a very unusual combination. Tell me why. And he gave me a story that completely explained it. He said, we're a toll road company. We've spent the last 20 years building the toll road. So the reinvestment is done. The toll roads just opened. So we're getting the growth. And these toll roads are often the only roads connecting the airports to cities or big cities to each other. So we have pretty much a monopoly. So there's low risk. And I said, okay, that makes sense. So with implausible and improbable, I'm pushing back. And if you can tell me a good story that explains it, I'll walk away. So with Uber, I took it through this three-part test. Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it possible? And the story I, I, I told for Uber was that it was an urban car service company. And in 2014, it was already succeeding as an urban car service company. My story was not that ambitious a story. I'd have had an easy time sustaining my story because they were already doing it. If I told you a much bigger story about Uber being a transportation company, or a personal mobility company, then my challenge would have been much greater and you should be pushing me to justify that much bigger story. 
So if Casper marketed themselves as a mattress company, that's an easy story to sell. But if they market themselves as a sleep company, much more difficult because what exactly does that mean and why would your success in making four mattresses, you don't even make them, you're a, you're a middle, you know, you're a broker in the middle. Why would that make you successful in selling furniture and carpets and other sleep related stuff? So you'd have to explain that to me. And that's what that's what you've got to think about your story is think of its weakest links and explain what it is that allows you to overcome them. Now, just as a cautionary note, I want to tell you that sometimes you'll hear or tell a runaway story. If you're an entrepreneur, you might be telling it. If you're an investor, you might hear it. And here's what makes a run for a runaway story. The first is you've got a storyteller who's charismatic, a messiah-like figure who tells a story and you so want to believe that story because you like the person. Second, the story is about disrupting a business you've never liked. So basically you want that business to crash and burn and this person is going to, and you say, good for you. And finally, just as a bonus, the narrator says, if we do this, we will change the world. We'll make it a better place. Now that's a story you want to succeed, right? And sometimes when you want a story to work out, you stop asking questions. Sounds abstract, but let me give you a very simple example. Let's suppose I came to you with a story of a 19 year old who drops out of Stanford. Who does that? What is the acceptance rate at Stanford last year? Like minus 3%? Unless of course you were a synchronized swimmer coming through the side door. That's a different story. Let's not go there. You, this person got into Stanford, drops out at 19 to start a business. You're seeing another tech geek starting a software business? No. This was a 19 year old woman already that's different dropping out to start a blood testing business now who amongst you likes the blood testing business you know how it works right you got to make an appointment six weeks in advance they make you wait two hours then a nurse like nurse ratchet comes out of the room and says come on in and they take two buckets of your blood and it takes you six takes them six weeks to tell you the results so here's what this 19 year old dropping out of stanford is going to do She's going to create a company where they take two drops of your blood, not two buckets. And in 45 minutes, run 32 different tests on that blood. And they're going to email you the results and the whole thing will cost you less than $100. Now, who doesn't want this to be true? And as a, as a, as a bonus, she's going to make this available for free to parts of the world where they can't afford blood tests. And that's going to improve healthcare around the world. Come on. Do you want the story to be true? If you were making a movie, you'd make her a heroine and say, this is a great story. And this is not a made up story. This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. Theranos is, of course, the blood testing company she created. And to show you how excited people got, Theranos was priced at $9 billion by venture capital firms in October 2015. It was not just venture capital firms that were excited. So, and many of these venture capitalists are among the best known, highest profile venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Now, Theranos was, you know, Walgreens had announced that they were going to have a Theranos lab in every Walgreens, one of the biggest pharmacy chains in the US, and jumped onto the bandwagon. The Cleveland Clinic, one of America's leading healthcare organizations, said, We're going to have, we buy this Theranos thing. It looks like they, they have, they're onto something. So if you had asked me in October of 2015 what I thought about Theranos as a company, my response would have been, I don't know much about them. They're a private company. But given the venture capital pricing and the, uh, the imprint from both Walgreens and from the Cleveland Clinic, they must have something behind them. But I was wrong because in October of 2015, a Wall Street Journal, asked, a Wall Street Journal reporter asked a question that any investor in this company should have asked. I mean, let me ask you a question. You're investing in a blood testing company. What's the one question you might want answered before you jump into the company? Does your blood test work, right? I assume somebody would have asked that question, but I was wrong. Because the Wall Street Journal reporter asked it and answered it because the results were in the public domain. The FDA is where you file these blood test, uh, test results. And he went to the FDA and said, how many of the 32 tests Theranos claims it can do on the blood have they been approved for? And the FDA said, one. He said, why? What, what's wrong with the other 31? The FDA said, the results are a little noisy. You saying, what's a noisy blood test? Trust me, you don't want to get one. Because here's how it'll work. You go in because you're feeling sick. The blood test results will come back and the doctor will look at you and say, you know what? You could be dying. Or you might not. Don't worry about it. We'll get back to this later. Not exactly a feature you look for in a blood test, right? 
So you're saying October of 2015, this is the first time that question was asked. Obviously, in the next six months, Theranos you know, basically goes to zero. It actually got priced at zero six months later. Elizabeth Holmes was banned from the blood testing business and still facing a lawsuit that could send her to jail. The whole thing unraveled in a, in a space of weeks or months. Now, when it happened in October of 2015, I wrote a post on my blog. And one of the questions I asked was, where was the corporate governance? What were the board of directors doing? And I took a look at the board of directors at Theranos. And my first reaction as I looked at that board was, he's still alive? Him too? George Schultz. You know who George Schultz is? He was Secretary of State under Ronald Reagan in 1981. Guys, a sprightly 94. I mean, as I looked at this list, my first reaction was, you know, if, if I were a cynic and you now we're designing a board of directors for a megalomaniac. And remember, megalomania is not just restricted to middle-aged men. You can have a 25-year-old woman with megalomania. Here's a ploy. You can, you know, I'd suggest if you want a board that will never ask you a question, pick a bunch of 80 to 90-year-olds, put them on your board, invite them for a board meeting, put a pillow in front of every chair because you never know when they'll fall asleep and have a backup ambulance just in case, and you'll never be asked a question. So my first question was, where's the corporate governance? That board of directors kind of told me where it was. Then I asked a second question. This was more personal. And I'd like you to think about the answer to this question. This, of course, is now history. The Wall Street Journal reporter who did this article has now got a book, and the book has become a movie. Everybody looks at Theranos as a cautionary tale. But Everybody assumes that, you no, know, that if they'd been at that meeting as an investor, they'd have asked the question. But I, in October of 2015, I asked, I, I, set up an, I set up the question. I said, let's assume this had been May or June of 2015 when Elizabeth Holmes was at the peak of her glory. She was one of the most celebrated businesswomen in the United States. She would give talks at meetings and the meetings would be filled with young girls who would be brought by their mothers who could point to Elizabeth Holmes and say, look, you can, you can be a billionaire by starting your own business too. She did it. Would you have had the courage if you'd been at the meeting to put up your hand and ask the question? You know, the question is, does the blood test work? Because think about it. If she'd said no at that meeting, you'd have felt like the person who shot Bambi's mother. Have you ever felt for that guy? Remember the Bambi movie? It starts with Bambi's mother falling in the forest. And I've always felt badly for the hunter who shot Bambi's mother. The guy must have gone through trauma and psychological counseling for the pain he caused. But you'd have felt like you were killing a dream. This is my problem when your story contains a component of we're going to change society and make the world a better place. Hey, that might be true, but the problem is once you bring that into your story, it becomes very difficult for people to ask honest questions and you have a much greater likelihood of a runaway story. Now, the, the flip side is you could see very quickly that the runaway story melted down in the case of Theranos. And with runaway stories, that's always the trouble. It's built around a personality. And if the personality is feet of clay, then the company melts down. So obviously this happened at Theranos. But in September of 2019, it's exactly what happened at WeWork. A runaway story where essentially one person bought the story, Masa Son, he kept piling more and more money into the story, and eventually the story blew up because the personality on which the story was built, Adam Newman, turned out to have feet of clay. So when runaway stories melt down, you're going to see an untrustworthy storyteller. The storyteller until yesterday was a messiah, has now become somebody you don't trust. The story you realize that at war with numbers, finally you've woken up. You also realize there's a bad business model and you bring those all together, your story starts to melt down. So if you're investing in a runaway story, remember, there is this very real risk that that runaway story could become a meltdown story. Just as a sidelight, um, I recently wrote a paper called The Big Market Delusion. You really don't need a paper. It's a very simple idea. And here's how it works. Let's say you see a, you see a big market. It could be online meetings right now after this crisis. It could be China. It could be artificial intelligence. And let's say you're an entrepreneur seeing a big market. Now, let me ask you a question. If you know any entrepreneurs or you're an entrepreneur, are entrepreneurs generally overconfident people or diffident people? Who do entrepreneurs tend to be overconfident or diffident? You can, you can answer in the chat if you want.
Yeah, I think they're overconfident people. In fact, that's what makes you an entrepreneur. You think you can conquer the world? So they're overconfident people. So good. So you're an overconfident person looking at the market. What do you think you can do? You can think you can conquer it. You go to a venture capitalist. And venture capitalists turn out to be overconfident people too. They think they can pick the winner. So let's say you're an overconfident entrepreneur and you've got three venture capitalists who think they picked the right entrepreneur. You have a cluster of overconfidence. And remember, you're not the only one seeing this big market. There are 100 clusters like yours all across the world. Each of you is overconfident. Each of you is looking at the big market. Each of you thinks you can succeed. You are, you're overestimating your chance of success. You're overestimating your revenues. Within each cluster, though, if I ask you what the value of your business is, each of you is going to give me a really high value, right? You're not being irrational. You're just being overconfident. Collectively, if I add up the values of all of your companies, you know what I'm going to find? The collective value that I get is going to be far greater, you know, and far greater than the actual value justified by the market. Carolina says, you know, you can be confident, but focus on reality. Guess what? You'll never start a business. It's very difficult to start a business if you don't have that little bit of overconfidence or a lot of overconfidence, because as I said, the nature of businesses is that you got to overshoot. Do you think Travis Kleiknik, when he sat down in 2009, said, you know what, I think this ride sharing business is going to take off? He jumped into a business where the walls were already up, but it looked like he couldn't make it. So in fact, studies consistently show that when you look at entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, they tend to be dramatically more overconfident than pretty much everybody else in society. So here's how it plays out. The collective value of all of these companies, given the market size, is going to be too high. What does that mean? Eventually, there's going to be a correction, not that far in the future. And that's what we call bubbles that burst, right? And when bubbles burst, what do you get from the naysayers? He said, this is what's wrong with, with markets. We should stop bubbles. So regulators and markets try to stop bubbles. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Bubbles are not a bug. They're a feature of these of markets if you stop bubbles you stop markets bubbles are what allow change to happen think of that dot-com bubble that burst right people write terrible things about it but it did change the way we live absolutely when was the last time you walked into a travel agent's office i've never been in one in 25 years everything i do is online Every bubble that bursts leaves a residue and that residue changes the way we behave. And as you go through the coronavirus and you talk about bubbles bursting, remember this too is going to kind of play out and changes in the way we live. And that's how change has always happened. I, I ask people, would you want to live in a world run by actuaries? They're focused on reality. Everything's based on expectations and probabilities. You know what a world run by actuaries would look like? We'd all still be in caves. Well, actuaries are still checking out whether fire is safe. They're probably concluding it's not safe. Let's stay in the cave for a few thousand more years. We live in a world where we need overconfident people overreaching to succeed. So I, I, whenever there's a bubble that bursts, I look at it and say, thank you, God, because this is exactly how change happens. One final example, and then we'll move on. Let's talk about uh, you know, DCF values. One of the things I look for when I look at a DCF is things that don't gel with each other. So I've talked about Tesla, and, you know, and Tesla is one of those companies which doesn't have investors. It has fans, including many of its analysts. Who have, remember the Stockholm Syndrome we talked about? Tesla's analysts have it full time. They think their job is to defend Tesla. So this is actually evaluation of Tesla from, from 2013. At the same time that I valued Tesla, you know, at, you know, I valued it about 150 and this, and this particular analyst had valued Tesla at 600. So I was curious to see why his value was four times higher. So I picked up his equity research report and I start leafing through the pages and I get to page 53. It was like a 250 page report. And he had his D.C.F valuation of Tesla. So I said, this is where I live. Let's see what he's projecting. So here's what he was projecting. He was projecting that Tesla would be successful. No, I and mean, I was projecting success too. I was expecting his revenues to be much greater than mine. And to my surprise, his revenues were actually a little lower than mine. He was projecting like 68 billion in revenues in 15 years, and I was projecting 69 billion in revenues. So I said, maybe his margins are much higher. So I looked at the margins, and his margins are actually lower than mine. So my, his revenues are lower than mine, his margins are lower than mine, but his value is four times higher. I'm completely befuddled. 
So I start looking at the difference between two numbers and, and I would suggest you do this as well. What he calls, what, what this analyst calls net income, I mean, if you work through this, an EBIT times, so basically there's an EBIT there. If you take the EBIT times one minus the tax rate that he's projecting, and you look at, so when he adds back the interest expense, that's what he's doing. And then you look at the subtractions and you get to free cash flow of the firm. The difference between after tax EBIT and free cash flow to the firm is actually what the what the, the analyst is assuming is reinvestment. So here's what I did. I added up the after tax operating income for the next 15 years and added up the free cash flow of the firm and took the difference. Now remember, this is a firm that he's expecting to be incredibly successful. It's an auto company where he projects out that the number of cars they will sell will go from 25,000 to 1.1 million. I don't have a problem with that story. But I was expecting to see huge amounts of reinvestment because to get from 24,000 cars to 1.1 million, Tesla has to build a lot of new capacity. And when I looked at across the next 15 years, the total reinvestment he was assuming was close to zero. In other words, he was growing the company, giving it great margin, but was reinvesting nothing. So I decided to call the analyst. He's at an airport on his way to California, maybe to visit a Tesla shrine and play to pray to Elon Musk. I don't know what he was planning to do. No, so, um, and, he's, and I said, I have some questions on your DCF. I was looking at your report and he said, I can't answer those questions. I said, why not? He said, because um, I don't do the numbers. And I said, who does the numbers? He says, we have a team that works on the numbers. And I said, a team turned out this DCF? And he said, yes. And he said, can I call you when your team's around? And he said, yeah, you can call me next week. You know, because I'll be back and my team will be with me. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And, he's, and as I'm getting ready to hang up the phone, he says, you're not going to write about this in your blog or anything, are you? I said, not for the moment, but a week from now, all bets are off. So a week later, I call him. His entire team is gathered around. The lead analyst comes on and, you know, I ask him. And he, say, he, tell, he says, look, I don't work with the numbers usually. So I ask him, I ask him what he does. And he says, I schmooze. Schmooze. You know what schmoozing is? He talks. He talks to management. He talks to experts. He said, I'll do a lot of schmoozing. I said, okay, what's your second in command do? He comes on and he says, I'm the secondary schmoozer. I go with this guy. When he schmoozes, I schmooze with him. The third guy in line says, I'm the backup schmoozer. One of these guys can't schmooze. I step in and do the schmoozing. I said, who in this group doesn't do schmoozing? Work with the numbers. They point to this 24-year-old kid they'd hired out of Wharton two years prior. And, you know, he says, he did it. I feel really sorry for this kid. Bright kid. And I lead him through the DCF and he very quickly gets it. And I said, what happened? He gets the fact that he's putting all this growth without building assembly plants. He said, it slipped my mind. I said, what slipped your mind? He said, I took last year's numbers and I just projected them out. Last year, they didn't have much in CapEx. And because of that, I assumed they could continue to have very low CapEx. I said, uh, do you think there's a problem? He said, yes, but I don't know an easy way in which we can fix this problem. I said, okay, um, it's true. You can't go to the market and say it slipped our minds. I said, now, have you ever seen this movie, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory? And he said, no. And what, But one of the older analysts had. And I said, when I saw that movie, one of the things that always puzzled me was you had one factory. Have you ever seen the movie? There's one factory, a very inefficiently laid out factory with like chocolate rivers running through it. And it produced chocolates that filled every store in the world. And I said, how the heck does that factory have all that capacity? And the answer is actually in the movie. You have these magical creatures called Oompa Loompas. And as they dance, chocolates come flying out of the factory. So I told the team that here's what they should do. They should put out a press release that Tesla has fired all of their workers and replaced them with Oompa Loompas. I call these Oompa Loompa valuations. Valuations where there's growth but no reinvestment. And you'd be amazed at how many DCFs fail this very simple test. So the next DCF you see, hopefully not the next one you do, I want you to take that test. Look at the growth, look at the reinvestment, look at the risk. And by the time you gauge that, you'll have a better sense of is this a valuation that I can put my numbers behind, that I can invest behind? Because that is the key to building a good valuation. So now I'm ready. I have my Uber story in June of 2014. I'm going to convert every part of my story into a number. So let's start at the top. I described Uber as an urban car service company. So the total market I went after was a global taxi and limo car service market, the urban car service market, which was $100 billion in 2013. 
It's actually very difficult to get the number for this market because it was dominated by taxi cabs around the world. I had to go city by city collecting numbers and I think 100 billion was a pretty good estimate. That market had been growing at 2% a year for the previous decade. I let it grow at 6%. Why? Because remember in my story, Uber is going to attract new users into the market. People like my son and niece, that's a 6% growth rate. I did assume that Uber would have local networking benefits, not global networking benefits. So I gave them a market share which was high by car service standards, 10% of the global urban car service market, but not 40 or 50%. Again, my story is driving that choice. And because I assume Uber could keep 20% of the fare without doing anything, I let them their operating margin be sky high in steady state because all they are is a broker. There's no manufacturing, no inventory, none of that stuff. They are growing without owning the cars and hiring the driver, so I let them have very high revenues for every dollar of capital they invest. So basically, the sales to capital ratio was five. That's twice as high as a typical tech company and thrice as high as any manufacturing company. I'm letting them grow with very little reinvestment. You say, how do you come up with the cost of capital? I not waste my time working through a beta, risk premium, a risk-free rate, because really, this is not where I'm going to lose this fight. So here's what I did. I went to the histogram. You know what a histogram is? I took the cost of capital of every publicly traded company in the world. And every year I update this histogram. I went to the 90th percentile and picked the cost of capital. So I said, it's a risky company. I'm going to, I'm going to give it the cost of capital of a risky company. It's not worth finessing the cost of capital to the nth degree. I gave them a 12% cost of capital. And as a final loose end, I said, all of this assumes that Uber will make it as a going concern, but they're still a small money losing company. So I gave them a 10% chance of not making it. With those numbers built in, the value that I got for Uber was $6 billion. Remember what the pricing was that attracted my attention to Uber? That VCs had priced the company at $17 billion. The value I got was $6 billion. I finished this valuation on June 8th of 2014. And... Uh, 15 minutes later, I get a call from a Wall Street Journal reporter. She must have been just waiting for this post to come out. She said, I noticed you valued Uber. I said, thank you for noticing. I said, uh, she says, I also noticed you attached a value of $6 billion to Uber. I said, you're very observant. She said, you do know that venture capitalists have valued the company at $17 billion. I almost corrected her then and there saying, venture capitalists don't value companies. They price companies, but she's a journalist. I cut her some slack. I said, yes. She said, how do you explain the difference. I said, I don't have to. I didn't pay the 17 billion. I've never felt the urge to explain what other people pay. It's not my business. She said, are you telling me they're wrong? I said, I'm telling you nothing of the sort. I said, I said, with my story and my valuation, I would not buy Uber, but maybe they have a bigger story, a better story that can explain their value. And that's the way I think about value. I don't own the story for Zoom. So yesterday when I put up my story and value for Zoom, I'm not telling you not to buy Zoom. I'm saying with my story and my value, I wouldn't buy Zoom at 113 because my value is only 75. But maybe your story for Zoom is much bigger. Maybe you think that this particular crisis is going to create a seismic shift in how we have meetings. That half of all meetings are going to end up online and Zoom is going to be the dominant player. You could have a much bigger story and a much bigger value. I can't prove I'm right and you're wrong today. But five years from now, one of us is going to be more right than the other. But only time will tell. So think about the story you tell because it has to be your story. That story will give you a value and that value should drive your decision. So I'm going to get to the last stage of the storytelling process. By this stage, remember what I have. I have a story for my company and I have a value that comes from the story. Do I like my story and value? It would be unnatural not to. It's my story, it's my value. Of course I like my story and value. So you want, when you show it to people, you know what you want them to tell you? Amazing story. This is exactly how I value companies too. And if you hang out with people who think just like you do, that's exactly the feedback you will get. So here's my suggestion. When you value a company, show that valuation to people who think least like you. Show it to your cousin, your elderly aunt. Show it to somebody on the street that you know and ask them what they think about your story. Don't give, hit them with numbers. Don't ask, what do you think about my baby? You'll get no response. Tell them your story for the company. Whether it's Zoom or somebody else, tell them the story and wait for the pushback. Don't get defensive. Listen, because you want to make your story better. You've got to listen. So for me, with Uber, I got, I got lucky. It got picked up in four very different places. 
The first was a site called 538.com. For those of you familiar with the site, site run by Nate Silver, it's still around. It's a statistics math site. Basically, it takes everything around us and applies math and statistics. It does it on politics, it does it on sports, it does it on pretty much everything. You know, so the guy who runs the site called me and he said, can I run your Uber post because you know, our readers would really like it. They're all numbers people. And I said, of course. The second place it got picked up, same blog, same post, same valuation, was the Forbes blog. Who reads the Forbes blog? I think 75-year-olds with flip phones, a much older, more value investing crowd. Same post, same valuation. The third place it got picked up was a site called TechCrunch. TechCrunch is a Silicon Valley digital magazine read primarily by geeks, by VC geeks, by tech geeks. And same post, same valuation because they wanted to run it too. And finally, the last place it got picked up was a site called The Ride Sharing Guy. It's still around that site. It's a site for Uber and Lyft drivers. Same post, same valuation, all four sites. I get four very different sets of feedback. From the 538.com site, here's the kind of question I get. Remember the cost of capital at 12% I used at the 90th percentile? The actual number was 11.97%. So I get a question of, I see at the 90th percentile, the cost of capital is 11.97%. Why are you using 12%? It's the kind of question that a numbers geek asks. And the reason I leave my spreadsheets open is I say, go try the cost of capital that you want, 11.97%, see what happens. Five minutes later, I get an email saying, nothing happened. I can see why you left it at 12. The Forbes blog, they love what I did. They patted me on the back. I didn't even spend any time. No, the TechCrunch people absolutely hated it. Their reaction was, how dare you? How dare you value one of ours? with your d.c.f and you know I, I, I my first reaction I mean in the TechCrunch article I actually had 400 comments 200 were pure insults most of which I didn't even get like one said you DCF guy that was a whole comment I don't even know whether that's good or bad but many of them start with an insult and then proceeded to tell me things about the technology of ride sharing that I wouldn't have known on my own I'm not a tech guy they taught me about how Uber collects data, how they said search pricing, things I would never have understood if I did not read past that first insult. And guess what? I learned about Uber. And then I heard from the ride sharing guy, you know, the breeders of that side. And I heard from an Uber driver in LA. And I heard things I would never have heard if I hadn't, if I talked to just top management. He said, I'm an Uber driver in LA. And, until, and I know they're going around telling people that they keep 20% of the fare, but it's not true. He said, in LA, here's what happened. I used to drive for Lyft until two months ago. Uber offered me $2,000 to switch. Now Lyft is offering me $2,500 to switch back. I feel like a free agent without a contract. And he said, I would be surprised if all of these payments, they've kept more than seven or 8% of the fare, not 20%. That's a big difference in your story, right? Now, three years later, Uber actually admitted that their contribution margin in the big cities is about seven to 8%. That, I, my reaction was, I heard that from your Uber driver three years ago. When I say keep the feedback loop open, I'm saying listen to everything around you because you're hearing feedback about your story. And that feedback should change your story sometimes and change your value. It all came to fruition for me while I was sitting in an airport in Munich waiting for a connecting flight. My flight was delayed. And I get a call from a guy called Bill Gurley. For those of you who don't know Bill, he's actually one of the lead Investor, lead investors in Benchmark Capital, a VC firm, one of the first firms to, I mean, to invest in Uber. They invested in a billion dollar value. So, um, you know, I'm sitting there, I, open, I check this email from Bill Curley, I open it up and here's how it begins. He said, I read your blog post valuing Uber and I did not like it. He said, we got that out of the way. He said, I've written my own blog post to counter your blog post. So blog post to blog post warfare, very 21st century. He said, I've said some mean things about you and I just want to let you know. Sincerely, Bill. I close the email. I have 45 minutes left for my flight. Guess where I go? I go to Bill Gurley's blog and there it is, lead article, Demoter and Mrs. by a mile. And he took issue with every part of my story. He said, Uber is not just a car service company, it's a logistics company. He said, it's not just urban, we're going to be everywhere. He gave examples of rural and suburban services. He said, we're not just going to be looking at local networking benefits. We're going to find a way where we take the cities we dominate in, like New York, and extend that. that. And he talked about connecting up with airlines and credit card companies. Essentially a story of how dominance in big cities will become dominance globally. I read his post. I was fascinated. 
So it was 10 minutes later, I write back to him. It was a short post and I say, would you like me to put a number on your story? You've told a really big story. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I can put a number on your story. He said, be my guest. So I went into my valuation and I changed two numbers. Remember the 100 billion I'd used as my car? I, I replaced it with 300 billion. I've replaced the car service business with the logistics business. Remember the 10% market share with local networking benefits to the extent that I believe the global networking story. I said, you can come up as one of the three or four top, the, the dominant ride sharing companies, a 40% market share. And with those changes, the value I got was 53 billion. I sent it to Bill and I said, do you like this more? He said, a lot. And he said, oh, by the way, I think our slice is this 20% is not long for the world. It's going to be closer to 10%. I said, not a problem. It's an input in my spreadsheet. I went and changed the 20 to 10 and I get a value of 29 billion. You can, you're can you saying, how can the same company be worth 6 billion, 29 and 53 billion? The young companies, the way you frame the story can give you very different values. In fact, in December of 2014 on my blog, and it's still there, I let people pick their own story for Uber. Very similar to the Tesla post that I just did a couple of weeks ago. So I asked people to pick what market Uber was in, what business are you in, what grow, whether they have no, whether they're going to double the market size, increase the market size, or have no effect, whether they have no networking benefits, strong network effects, or, or, or global network effects, and whether their competitive advantages are strong and sustainable or weak or non-existent. The value that I that that people got based on their choices range anywhere from less than a billion. If you thought of them just as another taxi cab company with no stuff going for them to more than 90 billion. And my point here is not that any number goes. It is to show that there can be disagreement about value with young companies. That disagreement is going to get smaller as the company gets more mature. Why? Because there is not that much room. So if you tell a story about Coca-Cola and I tell a story about Coca-Cola, our stories are going to be much closer than if we tell stories about Zoom. The younger a company is, the more divergent the story can be. Which brings me to my final point here. After you valued a company, let's say it's March, whatever, that story could change. I hate to tell you this, but something can happen that can make a change. In fact, if you finished your valuation in February, you got to revisit that valuation. Everything's shifted under you. Your story can change if you know if they, if you find that your company has either found you know, unexpected ways to enter markets or left markets you thought they could succeed in. Your story can shift if you think that something's happened that has that has changed the parameters of your story. You value Apple, for instance. The basic story might be the same, but the supply chain issues might cause your story to shift, or your story can break. I tell people, look, we invest in Tesla. Would you be surprised if tomorrow you woke up to a new story that Elon Musk has entered rehab? Now, I wouldn't be surprised. And if that happens, think of what will happen to your stock price. Your story could break. So basically, you've got to be open to the fact that your story can change, it can shift, it can break. And when that happens, your value can change as well. What I'm trying to argue for is there is this notion out there that if you do intrinsic valuation, that somehow your valuation is timeless. That is not true. There's no such thing as a timeless valuation. No matter what valuation you do, it's got to be revisited. So I'm going to stop there because I know that you know, we can, you know, next, we're can. we going to start actually, value, we actually haven't, haven't valued a single company and we're halfway through the semester. So when are we going to get to it? We're going to get to it in hyper speed when we start on Monday. So, you know, Monday being the 23rd or whichever it is, it's going to be online too. So I'm going to open up for any questions you might have about storytelling and connecting to numbers. And you can talk about your company. You can talk about what we talked about today. But if you get a chance, you can visit my Uber 2019 valuation. It was valuation of the week, I think, last week. Go take a look at it because you'll see how much my story has changed and how much my value for Uber has changed. So I'll leave it at that. And any questions? How do we adjust reinvestment of growth and reinvestment in our online? I mean, that's what I use the sales to capital ratio for, right? That's why I link. So you can either use the reinvestment rate or the sales to invested capital. They're both mechanisms for connecting what you're assuming about growth to what you're assuming about reinvestment. So one advantage in sales to capital is if you decide to pump up your revenue growth rate, your reinvestment will also have to go up with it, which is sensible. So use that reinvestment rate and sales to capital mechanisms, both of which we talked about as a mechanism for tying the two together.
No other questions? So here's, here's I'm going to leave you with some parting thoughts. I was planning to give you a seven day break from emails for the spring break and I'm going to stick with that, you know, giving with giving you that break. So you're, going, you're not going to hear from me for a while. I will be back with a vengeance a week from Saturday because I need to nag you, especially now that you're offline or online and you won't be physically in the classroom. I will, I will nag you even more about getting the project done. So what I would strongly recommend is even if you haven't done a spot of work on the project, that it's no time to start like right now. You know? Pull up the financials, start you know, learning as much as you can about the company because you know, we're, you know we will we, we will you know it, i want you to to have an intrinsic valuation of your company so no more questions okay we're done so i'm going to uh, put this online the recording will be on so if any of your friends weren't able to come to the session the recording will be on zoom i'm going to try to create a youtube version of it so all in all you should be able to get all of that stuff but that's about it thank you Oh, actually, Carolina has a question about an airplane manufacturer. Can I make a scenario where players like Embraer could move to the bigger airplanes market? No, it's not that easy. It's not, e it's not a question of technology. It's a question of building physical capacity. So you'll notice Bombardier and Embraer are not, have never been in the big. So that's the problem. Is Boeing and Airbus are it. The problem is the story you're telling could have changed dramatically over the last three weeks. Because who do they sell to? They sell to airlines. Why do they sell to airlines? Because airlines hope for growth. And the growth story was big, right? Everybody was flying everywhere. The coronavirus might not just affect air travel in the near future. It might have put a permanent dent in some of the travel, especially casual travel, which is going to make it difficult for any of the big aircraft manufacturers to succeed. In fact, if I were a small aircraft manufacturer, I'm probably better suited to this market than a big aircraft manufacturer. Those 300 seat planes might not be the kinds of planes people are looking for. Okay, that's it. Okay, let's um, stop for the day and... Um... The recording has stopped.